Ladies and gentlemen, uh, let's get ready to rumble! Thanks for joining the Dovision Experience Podcast. This week I got my guys, Boy James, and I got my boy B Coach coming straight from Atlanta. Boy James out of Iowa. They're gonna kind of help me out. We're gonna talk about this last this last damn documentary. I know these are sports guys. We're gonna kind of dive into some more things, some more sports topics, and probably some of the worldly things. Um, first off, I'd like to say, man, thank you guys for actually joining. I appreciate you guys coming on, man. I know it's late for you guys over in Atlanta and Iowa. I'm over in the, in the Bay Area. We're still on lockdown. You guys kind of moving around down there in Georgia. So I kind of want to know how I feel down there in Georgia, man. You guys kind of moving around, B. Man, man, honestly, I went to the gym today, man. Gym, gym busy like, like it was a regular day almost, man, you know. Everything's starting to open back up, man. You know, whether whether the numbers indicated or not, you know, everything's starting to move, man. You know, folks folks getting stir crazy, you know. So folks ready to get out and get moving, man. Especially out here in in A, man. You know, it's yeah. crazy. I know there's holiday coming up, so I already know it's going to be a lot of parties, day parties, pool parties. Going to be a lot going on with no social distancing. So how's it how's it been in the gym? Like, when you go in the gym, are people kind of like spacing out from one another, or is it just no? Um, no, ain't no, ain't no social distancing in the gym, man. Them folks either coming in groups, man. You know, people, people right next to each other, uh, doing bench press and, and squats and everything else. Cause you know, it's it's no social distancing. You know, very little mask on or anything like that. I mean, the workers in the gym have masks on, but but other than that, you know, I had mine on. You know, had some gloves on, whatever. But you know, everybody just treating like this. Before the, before the pandemic, man. Man, are people even wiping down the, the machines and equipment and stuff when you guys get done? Like, is it is it more of that? Because I know sometimes you get sweaty guys in the gym, they kind of wipe down stuff when they're done, but now that- Yeah, I'm, it's, yeah, yeah, they are. Now that, they are doing, but uh, they, I just try to stay in my own little area, man. Try to stay away from folks, man. Because I, I had to get in, I got tired of lunging in the parking deck, man. Yeah, man. <laughs> I haven't even been working out. I'm not even gonna lie. I just said, the end of the world, what am I gonna do some push-ups for? Why, why do it now? <laughs> Let's start doing some push-ups now. You know, I might as well just wait and get everything, kind of get back to normal again, try to stay working out. I, I ain't, I'm not a runner, I'm not gonna run. If I get out and walk around a little bit with the kids and kind of, you know, move around, but I ain't doing no work now, I'm not gonna even lie. How about you, boy, man? How things up in Iowa, man? I know the spring popping off up there and the cornfield's probably going wild. <laughs> yeah, man. Uh... It's crazy you say that because I live like it's dark now. You can't see out my backyard, but like it's a cornfield, like literally like 100 yards behind my backyard. Um, but it's 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 starting to things start to open up, man. Um, you know the kids' activities and things are starting to uh, get riled up, and you know like I went to Walmart today, and I was like, dang, you know. Before I was the only one in my household that was kind of going to the stores and stuff, but like. Uh, to, you know, we're kind of starting to let the kids go a little bit more as long as they had their mask on. And so we went to work today, and it was like, shit, it's better, like, uh, business as usual. Um, yeah. You know, a, a few more people had masks, and I'd say about, about 75% of the people had masks on, but, uh, you know, other than that, it looked, you know, looked like Walmart on a regular Wednesday at any other time. Do you think people have been taking it, just not been taking it serious, or they just feel like because they can't, it doesn't have a face on it that, that people don't really take it that serious because it doesn't have a face attached to it? I don't know. I don't know. Um, I, I feel like people taking it serious, but I, I think that it's just kind of human nature for people to be like, you know, it's, it ain't it ain't hit me, it ain't hit my people. So I'm just going to kind of plug it out and just try to, try to figure it out and just go out there and take my chances. Uh, we trying to, you know, we trying to tell uh, the kids and everybody to kind of mask up. My, uh, my fiance works in the, the University of Hospital, University of Iowa Hospital, uh, so she got to have a mask on, face shield, all that when she go to work. And so, you know, she kind of on the front line. She worked in hospital administration, but she's still kind of on the front line of it. So she in the hospital period. So yeah. Yeah, yeah. So she in there. So she, you know, she's seeing what's going on. Mm-hmm. And that's why. So, I think that's why I kind of been taking it a little bit more serious because like I said, my wife, same thing. She going to the, she work at the hospital, so she's on the front line. So she get to see it a little bit more and tell me what's going on a little bit more firsthand. So I take it a little bit more serious than somebody who probably doesn't, anybody related to 
anybody that work at the hospital, so they don't really see it. They probably just hear about somebody getting sick, but they don't necessarily see the impact that is happening on the hospitals and how they, you know, running out of masks and they're running out of just different things that they would normally have because they're being overpopulated from people who are coming in from being sick and things like that. So I totally get it, man. I totally understand. And here they just been kind of like they kind of letting it up a little bit. You know, you can't go out to the restaurants and sit down. It's all go to the door, order. You know, they give you food through the door. You kind of go back home, but there's no sit down like there's probably like in Texas or Georgia or anything like that. But you know, we kind of getting back to it. The economy kind of starting to move a little bit. They want to get it back on because each chicken- gas yeah, price is going back up too. Price yeah, you want to get out. But they ain't got enough. They ain't got enough chicks to send out <laughs> people every month. So they like, well, we got to get them back to work. And then, mm-hmm. So what you gonna Dude, do? I, I so appreciate that one they sent though. I take that. Ch- you gotta take that chance. So. <laughs> dive off into that, uh, that document. I'm pretty sure y'all both been kind of watching. That's the only thing that's been on that's entertaining. It's been ep- epic TV to me, epic TV to me because, you know, we didn't, we lived through it, but we, me personally, I was a little bit younger for the first three P. So the second three P is what I remember more and being, being able to see this documentary in full for 10 hours, you know, everybody tuned in at the same time, you know, real time, we can actually see like, wow, this guy was really the guy. Like we knew he was a guy, but going back and seeing it from the beginning, you know, all the way from childhood back to the to the to the last dance. And I just see, I just like, man, this guy really the guy, you know what I mean? Like, you know, this guy was he was relentless, he was attacking. So how you how you guys feel about it? just over be how you feel overall about it, man? How you how you man, overall, man, it's just how much of a competitor he was, man. Just like he was the ultimate competitor. Dog. Like no matter what he did, he he wanted to win, man. You know, and it, and it showed, you know. And that just show that just goes to show you, man. That you put your mind to, put your will to it, out Like you can do anything, but man, he was, he was a go get it out. Like man, ain't no, it almost ain't no words to to explain how he was in during this game, man. I'm like I'm watching the uh, the first uh, finals right now, man. The, uh, the Lakers, because I really, you know, uh, I really like you said, I really went into basketball in '91. You know, I think my first introduction was uh, when they beat the Suns. You know, I can I can vividly remember that I was in basketball camp in Mississippi State, and uh, we was all sitting around watching them beat the Suns in, in finals, man. So that's when I first really uh, got to grasp of who Michael Jordan really was. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, you know, it, like I said, that, that second run is when we really kind of, we, we had the impact, we were probably like, uh, we was kind of really getting the impact and seeing what was really going on and kind of seeing how he had influence over the world, even though he didn't have social media, it's kind of crazy how a guy who was that influence, influential throughout our, our life, but we were ever, we didn't have, we didn't have social media, the only thing we had was like magazines, East Bay, mm-hmm. movie, ESPN, ESPN. So boy, when you were coming up down on the, on the south coast of, of Mississippi, man, how did it, how did he impact you guys down there? You and your homies, what was you guys doing? With so, you? so I, I'm trying to like, um, like get my time frame because like we moved to the coast when I was in the fourth grade. Um, we lived in Dallas before then, um, and so I think the first. If I am mistaken, like when they played the Lakers, because when they played the Lakers, we lived in Texas. Uh, and then we moved to Mississippi, we moved to Mississippi, like around that time. But like you didn't, you know, we all the same age, so I really didn't. Uh, I, I knew he was good. Like I kind of like basketball. I like the Lakers because you know it's a long story, but I like the Lakers because we got some Lakers tickets when I lived in Dallas. Um, but. But man, not only was Mike so relentless and everything, but he was so damn good too. Like he was, you know, he took all that relentless and like I play harder than you, all that. You know, like you got cats like, you know, like Tony Allen or somebody that's like super competitive or whatever. But then like he was just the damn best. You know what I'm saying? He took it to another level, man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, like the, the wildest part, like it's kind of like an underrated part of getting to my breaking down the show, whatever. Like the craziest part was like when Bobby Knight, like, I hate Bobby Knight. Um, Bobby Knight told whoever was drafting, like, yo, y'all need to take Michael Jordan to point. Like, we need a center. He's like, well, shit, you need to take Michael Jordan to center then. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and, and it's crazy because Bobby Knight had coached him on the Olympic team. But like, Mike was just like, I was showing my son, I'm like, yo, Mike. It's just like so good, man. It's just, it's just unreal. Just like you know, not only like the competitive and like he was like driven to win and all that, 
like dude's skill set is like it's crazy. Like, you know what I'm saying? He go he goes from two weeks on the team to be, to like, hey, this is gonna be the guy. Two weeks in, they're like, hey, this is gonna be the, this is the guy. Like this will <laughs> the ball. He's gonna be that dude. Get out the way. We're gonna give it. Yeah. It was, he has so much. He has so much drive. It's like to be that young with that much drive. Like you know, as a kid, we have a little bit of drive. Then you have people who are older than you, parents, and uncles, and stuff, and kind of try to push you. But it just seemed like he just had that naturally after his after his brothers kind of like beat him up, pushed him around. Mm -hmm. Like hit that once he kind of like broke through the ceiling. He kind of just pushed through, and he just never would look back. He's like you never really seen anybody like that. You know, coming up at that time. You know, because he was. Just, yeah. The guy, like you know, you couldn't hear anything else about you. Like you knew about Charles Barkley, you knew about Drexler, you knew about these other guys. But Jordan was like, we every time Jordan played, you sit down in front of the TV. And so, yeah. you guys, yeah. can you guys think about like your first pair of Jordans? Like, can you remember your first pair of Jordans that you got? I had the um, <laughs> we. Like my people weren't paying like no hundred dollars for no Jordans back in the gap. But like I remember when I was in the tenth grade, a girl bought me some uh, for my birthday. Uh, but there was some teen Jordans. Okay. Because there was still, you know, some teen Jordans. The black was it the black and white one? Yeah. The native. The black ones with the white on the inside. They came they came out on my birthday when I was in tenth grade and a girl bought them for me. The next year, um, our basketball coach, Coach Stone, do you know Coach Stone? Yeah. Um, he's very Mississippi State. He, uh, yeah. some kind of way, he got messed up where we didn't get those team shoes for uh, for the season. And then our whole team went and got the 14s, I want to say. And so, um, so those were like the first real pair of Jordans. But like since I've been growing, I've been trying to buy like all the Jordans that I used to get in East Bay. Like for whatever reason, my people like they buy me like Air Max or like I had like Air Max pennies. For whatever reason, my daddy had like some kind of like I'm not buying you no know, Jordans. And, and, and so like I be trying to like I got like uh, I had cement. I got cement fours. Uh, I got the last size of the 14s now. Uh, I've been trying to find some concords for the past. Yeah, he's gonna make like six hundred dollars. Yeah, you gotta go. Man, since since the uh since the um uh, since the documentary, man, you should see how much they went up on StockX, man. It's it's crazy. They, yeah, I, mean, I know. Skyrocket. They ain't skyrocket. That's, That's kind of like Kobe's. I was trying to buy some Kobe's, like mm -hmm. so, like the week before he died, I just was randomly like, like, yo, I, I, I want to give me some Kobe's, and then. I, I ended up not doing it. Then, like the next week after he died, I'm like, "Dang, them charge like seven hundred dollars." I'm like, "No, no, wow." He shut it down and everything. So, man, just looking back at the documentary, I was looking at like, you know, I remember Scotty Pippen being like, you know, Scotty Pippen, but you don't, I don't remember like a lot of that little stuff with what was going on with Scotty, like him sitting nah. playing and all that. Like looking back on it, do you feel? feel did he pull like some some weak moves or feel like he like look at him like a quitter at some point at some point because we always just look at Scotty like man he was the guy. Man. Scotty got in his feelings, man. You know, Scotty Scotty thought he was the man, and when when you didn't get the man the ball, you get the play when uh, developed for the man, you man he shut down, man. You know, it, it was it kind of a whole move, yeah. But you know, he was in his feelings, you know. But you, like the kids would say now, he he was a hopeful today in today's uh, age, you know. But but now I bet looking back on it, man, you can't you can't fault that man too much for it, you know. What the you thing is, Scotty, they they interviewed Scotty the other day, and he was like, yeah, I probably do the same thing, yeah. bro. What are you talking about? <laughs> like, why would you know you can't do? So, so the crazy the crazy thing about it is, is that the game was tied. This is the thing that I was I was I was thinking about when I was watching. The game was tied. And so, like, what if Pucos would have missed a shot and then Scotty would have went back in that joint? I told y'all y'all should have gave me the ball. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like... And then, like, the next day, how you show up to practice? Like, like as a, my bad. As a, as a, like, as a teammate, how would you feel about that? Though? Like, that once the game was over, even though you guys won, how do you feel? How would you feel about it towards them? I'd be, I'd be kind of skeptical of them, man. Honestly, you know, when, when you gonna shut down again, you know what I'm saying? What, if you drop another play for him again, what you gonna do then? You know, you know you can't. Yeah, it's almost like you can't trust him. You know. Yeah, that's what uh, in the doc Mike said that like the next day he called Phil and 
was like, uh, yeah, you know, Scotty ain't gonna never be able to live that down. And he really <laughs> didn't. You know, like, like, like again, we were like kind of young, probably, probably like 10, 11 years old when it happened. But like, my pops was like, yeah, I, you know, I ain't been fucking with Scotty since then. But you know, then then you got thinking about it, um, how Kuk, when Kuk coach, you know, coming into the, to the team, you know, how they were feeling about him also, you know what I'm saying? So he already had that been dead against Kuk coach anyway, you know what I'm saying? So that was just like a, a stab in the heart to him, you know. You still gonna get this man the ball, even though you know I'm better than him, man. I won three rings already, you know what I'm saying? So, you know, I kind of feel Scotty, but I wouldn't have did that, you know what I'm saying? I would still win the game and play and did my part for the team, man. Of the situation, you know. I was, and then I've been thinking about it like since the, the you know, since the documentary been over, I've been kind of like just trying to replay it back in my mind and kind of think about some stuff. And I'm thinking about like if I think Phil almost kind of just kind of finessed Jordan a little in a way to kind of finesse Jordan. He was like, all right, we're going to attack this, we're going to attach this last dance name to this, uh, this last season. So even if we win, I get, I'm still gonna walk away. Like, there's really no room for us to kind of come back together. So Phil had pretty much almost made his mind up. Even though Jordan still had more years in him, feels like I might got my eye on him for us out in LA. I might have an opportunity to go out in LA. Yeah, he ain't put up no fight, man. You know what I'm saying? He just let it roll. He just, I, I was listening to something. They say, um, they said Phil had, was telling people, you know, like, yo, I'm going to the crib. Like, after this, regardless, you know, and, you know, Phil kind of matched the motivator. Phil might have made that 82 and 0 stuff up, you know. And what I'm saying? Phil, Phil wild like that. I say, do, 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 I kind of feel like Phil almost finished Jordan because the Jordan his stick, like, I'm pretty sure after that sixth ring, if Jordan would have said, hey, look, man, I want to try this one more time. We can make it work. I can talk to Scotty. I can probably get Scotty to take a little bit less. You know, I'll take a little See, bit. See, I don't think he could have got Scotty to take a like all that, yeah. so yeah. so so I, I, agree I think right I think I think I think that like Scotty would have been gone. Robin Robin was was out of there. Robin, you know, Robin they damn they want to play it in. He was you too much in Hannah anyway. And that's probably what, what made feel like I'm done. I'm, I can't handle this no more. I done, I done went long enough. We're trying to you know keep this together. We finally got this last dance out the way we wanted. Why well, try to come back and try to do all this over again? And he went, ran off to the sunset, and Jordan just kind of like got left holding the bag because he had already kind of put it out there, like, I ain't playing for nobody else but Jordan. So you kind of put yourself in the corner, you back yourself in the corner. So if Phil walk away, then you kind of like, oh, you got to be a man of your word. So you got to kind of, you got to walk away too. You can't be like, all right, Phil walk away. All right, we're going to get another coach in here. We're going to try to run it back again. So I just think Jordan kind of got finessed a little bit with that last dance. I think they, because they, they probably, he probably put, you know how I feel, the, like I say, he's a master motivator. He probably put that name on it to kind of say, all right, we're going to go all out for this. You know, we're going to we're gonna put all our energy into this. But if it don't work, we try. You know what I'm saying? If it don't work, we try. But if we, if we win, then I can say, okay, this was the last dance. We're done. I'm done. I feel, I feel like Phil was two steps ahead of everybody else in the game, man. Always. Always feels like nah, I ain't. Yeah, I'm going to the crib, get on these trees. <laughs> right, right. You got he, he was a different. He was a different type of coach, man. He went wasn't no other coach like him, man. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, you know. Yeah. So him just being the guy that he was, Jordan was like, look, man, I can't do it with nobody else but him because I know he the only person that can probably handle me, Scotty, and, and, and Rob, and all at the same time. No other coach can come in here because they. If you think about it, they'd already got a three P. You got another three peat, and you're trying to get another rookie coach or somebody who's not even at their level to try to tell him what to do in crunch time. Drum like, hey, look, I'm not listening to you. Like, like he told, like he told Phil, I'm not switching. He tell like you, man. <laughs> we're gonna, we're gonna, go, we're gonna switch off. He like, look, bro, I'm not, I'm not switching. Like whatever you say, I'm not doing. And so Jordan was like, hey, I'm the guy. I'm gonna do what I want to do. So I just feel like you know. Drum was just that he was so psycho, man. The guy was a psycho. Anytime somebody said something about him or said something to him, he was just like a made up vendetta to like watch the guy like he did so like Brian Russell. Like he go from he and baseball coming over just say hi. Russell just he like, all right, I'm gonna get you, bro. I got you. Put your money. Yeah. I got you. Yeah, just, yeah. just like the uh just like the part with the uh Washington Bullets player. The, the dude didn't even say nothing to him. You know what I'm saying? He he made it up himself. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Say good game. Good game. Right. And then next, he scored 36 in the game. Mike come back the next night. 36 in the first, first half. First seven in the first half. Yeah, it's, it's just like psych like, and then, you know, I know you guys were like, we were all young, but we were hearing about how he was gambling. Like, 
imagine you being that rich at that time and just 30, 40,000 a night. Like nah, that I, shit made my stomach hurt, man. I can't I can't even imagine that dog. Like for real. How much he was losing and probably winning at the same time, but he was probably losing just as much as he was winning just to stay competitive. Like, can you imagine losing that type of money and then going to drop 35, 40 points the next the, the next night? Like that means every, that, every that game would be the flu game for me. I had I'd be sick to my stomach, man. <laughs> I'm, I'm out there thinking about this boy the rack. I done lost the night before. Uh, you know, in the casino, I can't, man. I can't, I can't I'm ball a free throw over everything. Cause you, cause you remember like when he said he was on the plane and uh, he came up and played uh played cards with X and they were playing for dollars and stuff. He's like, man, I just want to say I got your money. You know what I'm saying? He, I mean, that's just that's just the type of competitor he was, man. Even when he was flipping quarters with the, the security people, man, he was throwing twenty dollars on quarters, flipping quarters. Bro, man, like we used to flip, we used to flip quarters too, but not for no twenty dollars. <laughs> we flip quarters for a quarter, quarter, right? <laughs> Trying to get a little lunch money or something, trying to get some money up out somebody for no $20, bro. You, you hear a million now, he out here flipping, flipping quarters for $20. Like, that's crazy. But, man, you know, watching this doc and, and watching that last, you know, watching the last series, you know, the last um, with the last couple episodes that they dropped, and just seeing how, you know, Reggie Miller and his thought process, like, I remember, I remember, you know, saying that Reggie Miller, how Reggie Miller was going at Bulls, but he just, he just couldn't get over that hump. How you feel about how Reggie Miller was perceived, you know, in the documentary as well as when he was playing back then? How'd you guys see Reggie? So I this mean, was like the age. We go ahead, B. No, you go ahead. Go ahead. No, so this was like probably like the age where we was like in high school. I feel like um, you about ninth. Reggie Miller was out there. Ninth, tenth, eighth, ninth grade, eighth, ninth grade. Yeah, so, something like that. Like we was, I, I like I remember those games. Like I was watching it and I was calling out like. I remember him like pushing off on Jordan um, to make that shot at the top of the key to send it to overtime. But man, I always hated Reggie Miller. I, like, I I don't know why. Uh, I don't have no respect for that dude, but like, I don't like him as a commentator. I ain't like him as a player. <laughs> you know, I, I don't know why, man. He ain't never like do nothing. Like, I remember when they played the, the uh, Lakers in the finals, and he was garbage that series. But that was on the back end of his career too, though. You know what I'm saying? So, no, nah, that was in like 2002. When or Reggie retired? Like Reggie retired in like 07, 06. Okay, okay. I I looked at him as an old man back then, like when he yeah. I general. mean, he probably he probably about yeah. He was Jalen Rose on the team. Uh, mm-hmm. He probably was about uh, ten years in or so. So probably on the back side of his prime. So still, but man. I, just, man I, I just like I like Reggie Hart though, man. Reggie wasn't gonna back down to the man, you know what I'm saying? That's what I like about Reggie, man. You know, he, he, cause I, you know, I was so skinny too. He was skinny, you know. I was like, I, 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 you know what I'm saying? I was like, man, you know, give give somebody some inspiration, man. He said, no matter who it was, you gonna go after him, you know what I'm saying? You know, he went that black Jesus, <laughs> black Jesus showed him what it was, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Thomas. And didn't they get in a fight too? Didn't at some point? Yeah, he because because Reggie Reggie mushed him. Mushed him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Through the like then so when so that. Reggie fought Reggie fought Mike and Kobe. Yeah, he was just he was relentless at going that mm-hmm. he, he had no fear. You know, so what we're gonna do, we're gonna head, go ahead and wrap this segment up. We'll come back with the next segment. We're gonna get some more of that, you know what I'm saying, that, that last dance talk. Um appreciate, appreciate you guys sticking around, come back for the next segment. All right, bet. Appreciate you guys coming back for the vision experience. We can come back with our, this our next segment, um, fellas. How y'all feel about Jordan? Do y'all think Jordan was a was a bully? Y'all looked at him as a bully at all after seeing out the series? How this uh, doctor went? I, so so I think he was a bully, but um, you know, in today's like, like, today like, sense, yeah, he was a bully. In but, today's but check, sense, check this out. Back, check this out, B. So. Back then, he was just being, you know, just nigga. Like, check it. So if he, if he like any other bully, if you stand up to him, you hit him in the mouth, you you good money with him. Kerr. He bullied Kerr. Kerr punched him, got punched back. <laughs> <laughs> so that was his guy. 
last shot. Like, look, hey, I'm coming. They coming. They double team me. I'm coming to you. Kurt, I'm ready. Yeah. Are you ready? <laughs> you got to respect from them. Yeah, yeah, but like some of the other cats, some of the other cats, they, they kind of got bullied. But you, you see that, you know, uh, I was reading somewhere, and I was attending to my screenshot that I had on my phone, but they said Bill Cartwright told me, uh, when he was his teammate, you start talking all that to me, I'm going to break your legs. Yeah, uh, I think Robert Perry said something to the same, something to the same yeah, thing, too. We, we talk about, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, so, you know, they talked about all the people that he you know, pushed a certain way. Um, as teammates, but he ain't talking about none of the people that, you know, pushed back. You know, shoot, he, he talking all day. You know, he ain't talking about the robbery. Yeah. You know, he, yeah. He, he, went got, he went and got robbed in Vegas. Hey, look, man, we got to go. Come on, we're knocking on the door. <laughs> Go. Like, let go. Carmen let you in the room and everything. Man, how crazy, how crazy y'all think that room was, though? Man, I bet it was out of control. Drugs, everything. Man, everything everywhere, dog. I know he was going to crazy. Man, that was, that was 90, what was it, 90, uh... It was like early 97 or something, 98? No, that was 97. That probably like 97. It was, yeah. Oh, they probably, they probably had some drugs that's probably just not coming out back then. And Robin, you know, Robin got all that money. You know, he hang with Carmen Electra. She got all that money. Shoot, man, they was on some drugs that we don't even know about yet. And, and, and it wasn't just them two in the room. I guarantee you that. <laughs> and some of the baddest on back then. They was at the peak of their careers, and Robin had them, boy. So Robin was getting it in back then, boy. Man, I ain't know Robin was like this with like Madonna. I knew about Madonna, but like Tony Braxton. What I'm saying, like he had all, you know, what I'm saying he had all the women who was at the top of their career, and he right there next to him, living the dream. Living the dream. He, hey, that, like, that's, how, you, that's, oh, that's show you what money gets you. Money gets you, bro. Money, fame. When you excel in sports, you can kind of get out there and get your name out there. Like, how else could you get that close to those type of, you know, superstars without being one yourself? You know, you come from mm -hmm. Pistons, you go know, Bad Boys, you get a couple rings. You go down to San Antonio, you kind of blow that. You know, you ain't really, you ain't really do nothing down to San Antonio. Then he goes back up there with Jordans, put him right back on the mat with winning. Like people, com people complain about you know Jordan being bully and all that type of stuff. But it, when you when you next to greatness, like he can't fail. Like Jordan, like look, man, I gotta do whatever it takes to get these guys to play because I can't fail. Like if I, because if I lose, it's Jordan lost the game. It ain't the book was lost. It's Jordan. I felt like, look, man, I gotta do whatever it takes. Like, think about it. He went against Utah. He put a 45. The rest of the team put a 42. Like, he like, <laughs> whatever it takes to get this W. You know, cause Scott, you know, Scotty with the locked up back. You know, you can't trust. You can't trust uh, Steve Kerr to put up 25. So he like, man, I gotta go. So that's why I feel like, you know, when it comes down to bullying, I think it was more that's like tongue and cheek a lot. You know, when you be in practice, man, you kind of just talk, talk trash to anybody in any, any kind of old way, just throwing stuff out there, just saying this, saying that. But you don't really mean it. You know, you know what I mean? I mean, I think that was just his way of motivating people, man. Really mean it. Like, he probably, you know, he probably just developed that skill. You know, it's, it, I, bet, I bet it's really hard to be that good and then be next to somebody who's not that good and you wonder why they can't be, why you can't do like, dude, why you can't make that's it? That's why they can't coach, man. That's that's why, right. like, great, great, great players can't coach. That's that's what uh, drove Larry Bird crazy. You know, Larry Bird coached for a few years and just couldn't take it no more. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Magic Johnson tried to coach for like half a season. Just couldn't yeah. take it. Just couldn't get it figured out, man. You know what I'm saying? Isaiah Thomas tried to coach, you know. Mm -hmm. But you had, like, role players like Steve Kerr, Doc Rivers, you know, Phil Jackson was a role player, like those type of guys that's, you know, got medial talent. Um, you know, they end up being a great coach because they can probably identify with, you know, you know, everybody not a Michael Jordan, everybody not a Matthew Johnson, everybody not Isaiah Thomas, but it's a whole lot of Steve Kerr's, it's a whole lot of Doc Rivers, you know what I'm saying? Exactly. It's more yeah. cerebral when you're on the bench, you look at the game different than somebody who is like processing the game at a faster pace. Like, what, what do you think is the mindset of somebody who like a Steve Kerr who has lesser talent than Jordan, but at the same time, he's able to coach guys and push guys in a different way? Do you think it's just because he's able to see the game differently, even though he's not like at the peak level like a Jordan? Yeah, I think he can, he can decipher who, who's got it, who doesn't have it, you know, and how to intermesh all those people into, into a good team, you know what I'm saying? 
you know, and get the best, get the most out of them, you know. But you know, but like Steve Kerr had, you got, you got Clay and Steph, man. You, you just put one, two more pieces around, you good, you know. And, and that show, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. Shoot, and then you get KD. Yep. Oh uh, yeah, he, I mean that was, you know, they had to win that. <laughs> Ferrari, look, don't crash this man. We give you everything you need. Just keep the car in the road. Mm-hmm. We'll do what it's gonna do. Y'all just don't crash against the wall. And so mm-hmm. I think I said like that just might be the mindset. How y'all how y'all think about how y'all feel about them just giving Kurt that spotlight about like his dad and all like I ain't know all that about Kurt. I'm not gonna lie. I mean I mean it, it hit different when you hear it here when you heard his mom talk about it. When you hear, when you hear how, how she lost her husband, her husband, she going into the office saying her husband gets shot in the head, man. You know what I'm saying, man? They hit different. You know, you you hear the stories, you know, you read about it, but it just hit different when you hear somebody white saying how they lost their husband, man. That just like yeah, that like damn, it broke my heart too, man. You had to re- then you had to relive that again. You know what I'm saying? Ain't, ain't no telling how she probably relived that every day of her life, man. But that's just that was just a sad situation. You know what I'm saying? And as, as you think about it, man, like throughout that time when he was on that run, he had the league in a chokehold. And as a, a great pair of player like, say, Charles Barkley or Patrick Ewan or, 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 or uh, Carl Malone, like, how do you think these guys feel about not being able to get that chip because of Jordan? Do you think they hate Jordan? Or they just, just like, okay, this is the goal. We're we just going to have to give it up for him. Like, going through that time, how do you think those guys felt about that? How do you guys think how they feel? They just ran to a bullshit, man. Um, <laughs> you know, really ain't nothing you can do about it. You know, it's kind of like, uh, you know, probably like like the cats playing college football right now. We shoot Alabama and Clemson pretty much. I mean, LSU was one of like for the past, you know, however many years, it was three or four years. It was Alabama and Clemson every year. You know, you, you know, LSU basically. You know, LSU beat the crap out of everybody and then run up on Alabama. Run up on Alabama. Run up on Alabama. So it is kind of, you know, I hope both sides will never hear this. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but it, 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 it's kind of, you know, kind of the same way. Like, what do you do, man? You know, Brian Ball, Charles Barkley, Patrick Ewing, Clyde Drexler, you know, all those guys. Well, Clyde got some in Houston, but, you know, all those guys were, were real you know, superstars. Like I said, we're looking back on that, man. It's just, you look at the players that he stopped from getting rings, you like, wow. Like, you know what I'm saying? You look at those players and like, those guys would have definitely got that ring. Cause like, as soon as Jordan kind of left, you kind of saw Houston kind of take that, take that mm-hmm. upward trajectory move. And then Jordan come back and he's like, all right, I'm back. I'm taking it back. I'm putting it right back in the choke hole. I'm going back, we're getting this three-peat again. So I'm, I'm surprised like a, a lot of other teams didn't take that route where the bad boy Pistons did and it's kind of just kind of like try to bully Jordan and rough Jordan up a little bit more instead of just letting him have free reign, you know, doing all this. I'm, I'm pretty sure they kind of, you know, came out picks and gave him elbow, but not like the, like the Pistons was doing. Like the Pistons were kind of like just putting the a whole- Pistons out there like rational, man. Man. Man, I mean, <laughs> it's almost like football out there now. This is like for real, you know what I'm saying? That way they were repping Jordan up, but he, he made a change though. He went, he went and got in the weight room that he never did, you know what I'm saying? It's just like I, I, I look at it like uh like going up Mississippi, like going up against South Nova. You know, you might have had a great team. You know what I'm saying? You might have had a great team, but when South Nova came, man, that fear just hit you. You know what I'm saying? He's like, oh, I can't you can't beat them, man. No matter how good your team with South Nova, I'm punch you in the mouth and lay, lay your ass down. You know and you got and you're looking at y'all for South Nova Claudel like us, like we look on the schedule like, oh we gotta play Claudel, we gotta bring our A game. But it just seemed like something Claude had had a consistent coach. They had the consistent junior high coach, so they was running the plays from junior high all the way to high school. But when I was coming through high school, we had I had three different coaches in four years. We had like three oh wow! So anytime, every time you play a class there, they already was lifting weights, so they was ahead of the game. We weren't lifting weights in the summer, like we you know, we weren't really doing it. It was just like you bring we're gonna bring our skilled players, and we're gonna play against people who playing like a lockdown system. So you got a lockdown system with skilled players, so they were always like, it was a tough game, then they would win or get us at the end. It was just like, it was deflating to play players, like to play the team. It was always deflating because they were always felt like, once they were superior to us, even though they, we was like a school, four school, they were like five, eight, so it was a bigger school, but 
we felt like we could compete with them, but but they just ran the they ran the same system year in and year out, and we come with the wing. Mm-hmm. Here we come with the spread. The next year we come with the, the with this system next year, and they just like, oh, we're gonna keep playing our game and just keep steamrolling us every year. So I totally get it, man. Like those guys were doing that time. It was like, man, we got to beat them. Because think about it, Utah had the team. They had them back to back. They had the team to beat them. It's just like yeah. superiority on the floor just outweighed and out, out and, I mean, I mean, that one player, you know what I'm saying? That one player made the difference, you know what I'm saying? That one player yeah, happened to be Jordan. The crazy thing about it is, is that, like, I don't, I really don't think that. And I, I kind of didn't think about, like, yo, you think, like, we got seven that next year? I don't know, man, because San Antonio won it that next year, you know, and that's Duncan and Robinson. Lockout season, though? Wasn't that the lockout season? That was the lockout season, so they was playing, but they, they you know, I, I was listening to a podcast, uh, they were talking about, they, you know, they squeezed a whole bunch of games into, like, a short period. They played 50 games. Yeah, they were playing, yeah. like, three nights in a row some night, sometimes, and, you know, like, the playoffs, there wasn't no breaks in the playoffs, just trying to get everything in. And you know, Dunk, Duncan and Robinson was, was the twin. You know, Robinson was on the twin towers. Yeah, yeah, Robinson was on the tail end of his his uh, career. Got Duncan was a monster. Yeah. And on that tip, you know, we've been, you know, I've been hearing, like I said, I've been hearing rumors and watching and just reading stuff. And he's talking about the guys, the NBA guys, maybe coming back mid June, and then they might be playing some ball in mid July. How do you think that's going to affect the NBA and? ring like I think me personally I think the ring probably won't have the same cachet in the, like right now but down the road we won't think about it we just look at it like the lockout season like a ring's a ring but you know when you're trying to think about people like LeBron compared to his legacy and getting the ring and possibly winning the ring in a uh, short season like that how do you think that's going to look on people's resume looking back on it? he gonna get criticized for it you know he, he gonna get he gonna get knocked for it you know what I'm saying he, he gonna get I mean Speaking as right now in the current moment, yeah, but you know, 20 years from now, like you said, nobody's gonna think about it. Even like, oh, he got another ring, you know. But right now, if he win, if he win this year, they win the championship, and yeah, he gonna get, he gonna get criticized for not playing a full NBA season. You know, that's but that's just how people do LeBron, though. You know what I'm saying? So yeah, yeah. yeah and I, I I think I think that like like I never heard anybody say anything about the Spurs team that won that lockout. Nobody ever said like, oh, well, they, you know, they only played 50 games this season. I've never heard anybody say that, but like he said, like, this is kind of how it go for LeBron. <laughs> Somebody gonna say it. Yeah, that's what I say, though, because you, you, you're trying to play, you, you got to basically, because I think the end of the scene was like 20 games left, so you're trying to do 20 games, and then you're trying to turn around and play a seven-game series. Man, those guys are gonna be out of shape. It's gonna be some sloppy basketball. Man, it's gonna be some injuries too. It's gonna be some time. It's gonna be all like I under I want I want the basketball, but I want to be at its its purest. I want to be at its mm-hmm. you know the pandemic came in and it kind of destroyed everything and put through mm-hmm. our But I wanted to see the game at its purest or with these guys in shape. You know, you did it because like I said, the injuries are part of the game. So I like to see how these coaches maneuver through these injuries. And but I want to see the guys healthy in the playoffs. So this might give us a good one. So, um, Kawhi was already doing load management. So, if he comes back after he's been off for two months, it should be no load management. It should be like full throttle air. Right. So, let me give seven games in to see these guys compete for seven games. What do you think is going to go to? What do you think is going to go from now? Because they're trying to say they might do it all in Orlando. I mean, at this at this point, man, I just want to see some sports. I want to see some sports that I like. You know, say I want to see basketball. I want to see football in the fall. So, I mean, whether it's fans, where they play, where they play in the uh, summer league gyms or wherever they play, man, I'm just, I'm ready for sports to happen. You know what I'm saying? You know, I just want. To I see think some I think that bubble out actually. You know, I think that bubble. I, I think that bubble out there is like really dope, honestly. Um, for them all to kind of like be in that same kind of in the same space, you know, to... I mean, know, it kind of give you that A you somebody. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> definitely, definitely. Because um, it's just like, it's just like Summer League, like, they're just going to be out there, you know, mm-hmm. like in, in Orlando, you know, it's the facility, I think they said they got like four courts all in one facility. And so, yeah, it, it'll be definitely like AAU, but, you know, it'll be... 
be Baltimore sports. Game. It's gonna be something to watch on TV, something to talk about. Yeah, we're gonna be basically hearing the ball hitting the floor every time. We're gonna be, <laughs> you know, every whistle, hear everything everybody say, man, you know. But I think if they, you know, because if you go to, you know, you've been, you've been to a live basketball game before, so they have a lot, they have the crowd noise, but then they also have like music and other things going. Mm-hmm. They kind of pump that kind of sound along with it. We'll kind of, after you first hear it, you'll be like, oh man, it's kind of it's kind of like down. But then after a while, you kind of get into it, you won't even think of it. Like it's almost with the UFC. We, yeah, I was just thinking about that. Start watching, I'm like, man, like this is, like, what's going on? It's empty. But then you start hearing the commentators talk, you hear the players talk, you hear the coaches talk, and you just kind of just hear like the, the stuff that you wouldn't normally hear. And then after mm-hmm. about it, you just like really into the game. So I think it's going to get like that eventually after maybe a couple of games when we, or they can, or they can probably sell some seats, but just sell like separate the seats. Maybe just do like you know how you, I don't know if you guys watched it, was it XFL? But they just sold they sold like the lower bowl. They they, they just sell yeah. or the lower bowl and then spray them out. I think that would help too to kind of help with the visual for us at home watching as well too. Because man, them them seats gonna be so expensive, man. That boy Bezos, you know, Bezos, how you say his name? He gonna uh, he gonna be the one that buy up all the seats, man. Him and this kid gonna be courtside, you know, you know, two fifty, two fifty, two hundred fifty thousand a seat, you know, to watch watch LeBron or Kawhi go at it, right? In Orlando, man. Yeah, but give me ESPN, man. Yeah, and me watching it, like I've been like, I don't know if you guys, you know, going to going to live sports game. I would rather watch it at home, man. I just get a better a better view and experience when I'm at home. Mm-hmm. You, you could see, you, I mean, you got to be so focused when you go to a live sporting event, man. You can't you can't sit there and say something to somebody. You know, you got to be paying attention, especially basketball, man. You know what I'm saying? You know, like I don't know, man. I, I like I like going to the game. We, we went. I took my son to LA last year for spring break. We went to the Lakers, man. That's that's that was the best to me. Uh, and maybe because I don't live like in a city that have it all the time. We got the University of Iowa here, so we go we go see uh, you know high level football football all the time. Um, but shoot, man, we, we went out there saw Braun. They played the Nets. Uh, D'Angelo Russell was going crazy. You, know, you kind of pick up on. We have some good seats. You can kind of pick up on like some of the smaller things that's going on on the court that you don't see on TV. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's, it's like that in the A, man. You know what I'm saying? But it, 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 everything is a, is a big social event. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> everything, every sporting event is a social event. Man. You go to a Falcons game; it's more social than it is about you watching the game. And same thing with the Hawks. You know, like uh, last time I went to a Hawks game, man, I primarily went to the game to see Big Rick. Halftime show, you know what I'm saying? So <laughs> I ain't care who was playing, you know. Trey Young went off that game, but at the same time, man, I wanted to see Crit, you know what I'm saying? Crit, my favorite artist, man, you know what I'm saying? So yeah, yeah, it all depends. It all depends on who, who's playing. Like, uh, like uh, I went when uh, I seen LeBron playing in Atlanta too, you know. But that was a that was a little bit different because you, know, you know you want to see your favorite player play, you know what I'm saying? So you're a little bit more into the game. Anything else, dog? It's, it's more of a social thing to me than anything. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, and I like I've been being, you know, out here working in the Bay. I kind of come across chickens every now and again. So I got an opportunity to go to one of the Warriors game at the new Chase State, the new Chase Arena. You know, the arena is amazing. You know, we were sitting there watching the game. We had, you know, some really good seats. We like club level seats, so we get to go, you know, get the food and all that good stuff. And you get to see, like right up on the screen, so you get to see the game, but. You know, I, a, a part of me like still trying to. I really could. I was into the game, but you just come like if you was at the TV, you can hear the commentators, see what they're see what they're talking about. You can see the replay because they don't show all the replays of the game. You see the replay, see what, see what the guy how he came out the pick or what happened. You can get a little bit more of the details in the in the game from the TV. And it just I just think that that virtual reality world is probably going to be the next thing for like watching sports. You know, I'm not really into it now, but I think that could be like the next thing where you can be put on the goggles and you can actually sit courtside and be like, okay, I can see. Yeah. The yeah. home you get you at home, but you still get a full gaming experience. So you know, that's this is this another level with this technology going. The pandemic hitting and people having to readjust their lives. And new companies are starting to emerge, and new companies are going to come 
get birth from this. So I just think the technology is gonna really take off where a lot of the stuff we were doing from the 80s and 90s and 2000s that we just did just because, now with this pandemic, things are just gonna change. The technology is gonna take us to another level. And I think it's gonna, it's gonna take a, another another step as far as like our viewing, like viewing sports and how they televise sports and just in general. Because if you think about it, when they did the playoffs last year, they had already did TNT their online thing they did like a full full analysis of like like eight or ten cameras in one stream they kind of showing you everything that's going on in the game so i already feel like our viewing experience is actually changing because we're not just necessarily watching in front of the tv anymore we're watching it. Mm-hmm. you don't get that one camera you get more than one camera angle you, i mean you get multiple camera angles you see you see stuff you would never see at, at the live event you know what i'm saying you never see, you know, you never see, oh, he got, he really did get hit up side of the back of the head. You wouldn't see that in the live event, you know what I'm saying? You just like, you just knew that it was a foul, you know what I'm saying? You knew how to stream the foul or whatever the case may be, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah, so, I don't know, it's just, I just feel like it's going to change, it's going to improve. Like, this pandemic is going to change a lot of our lives and how we, our kids are going to be really affected by it because the things that are going to birth, they're gonna, we're going to be kind of living through it, but they're going to really get the benefit of it next year mm-hmm. benefit of like you know how the baby boomers came back and they kind of developed these new systems but we was the one who kind of benefited from it that's how they're going to be the next generation you know, our kids or the next generation behind us are going to get all this technology that we create and we're going to they're going to take it and evolve and it's going to get it's just going to get better man it's going to get it's going to get so much better because you know we just gotta we gotta re, rethink of how we're going to do things now you got, but we and, we, and, and as a as a society, we have to be able to uh, accept change. You know, we we've been living, living this lifestyle so long, man. Now, now like boom, it's time to change. You know, what I'm saying so people not so people are used to just doing the same old thing day in day out. They not they not used to change. You know, what I'm saying in that show, like like we were saying earlier. You know, what I'm saying nobody's social distancing or nothing like that. Everybody's trying to go around, go around as their normal routine, but. You know, normal routine is out the door, man. That was yesterday. You know what I'm saying? That was two months ago. Two months ago is is, is history now. You know what I'm saying? Ancient history. And yeah, <laughs> kind of get off on. I know we we are some of the, the music heads in our group chat. We talk about the music and all that good stuff. And now this pandemic has actually gave us an opportunity to kind of listen to some of this old music that we grew up on that we probably don't just listen to every single day. But we ain't seen these IG battles, you know, with Swiss Beast and Timbaland kind of put together with the versus thing, which I think was amazing. It was an amazing thing they put together. Me personally, I think it should be on a bigger platform now. Like I keep saying, like I think that they pro- they got a proven concept. And I think the concept now needs to be taken to like a recording like studio where they kind of set it up with the lighting, they battle each other, and they put it on like a recorded session where they can record it and put it on Netflix or some type of streaming program where we can get a little bit better. You know, watching it on your phone is great. But then you have your limitations, what you can do on the phones. You're like, oh, yeah. I really wanted to like really get into the Nelly and the Noodle battle, but Nelly just couldn't get his Wi-Fi together, so it kind of it kind of ruined the experience in the beginning. Even though he kind of got it into it, but I think the streaming services it would have been it would have been so much better if it's like say you, you did it on Netflix, you put ten episodes together, you put ten battles, and you just put it out on Netflix, and we just all watch it. But I mean, go go ahead. Just like you were saying, like we like something's new, like that's gonna be the new concert. Yeah, I feel like you know what I'm saying it's gonna be it's gonna be more 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 uh more oh, concerts yeah, yeah. gonna be streamed now. You know what I'm saying? Cause, I mean, to cut you off. Did you see the tour when you you just talked about talk, talk about the live? Did you see the Tory Lanez? He actually, man, the guy the guy is kind of smart what he did. So he had the quarantine radio that he was doing over his live for a couple of weeks, and that took off, and then he. Mm-hmm that to a live concert on YouTube. So he went to YouTube, YouTube gave him a bag. He had a live concert straight for YouTube. And he made yeah. it to yeah. But like I said, that's, that's, that's the way we're gonna have our concerts. Uh, that's how it's gonna go. That's, that's how it's gonna go going forward to me, I think. Uh, like, you even look at like the Beyonce thing that she did a couple years ago, it was at Coachella. But like, you know, we all saw it after you know, live. You know, and then, mm-hmm. you know, and now yeah. it's on Netflix and now, you know, you can watch it forever, you know what I'm saying? Um, so I, I think, you know, it's just one of those things that's going to be, you know, like a new normal. Like, I got two sons, one's in fifth grade, one's in kindergarten. And so, like, they not going to, you know, they probably not going to have the same experience going, growing up, going to concerts and all that. But they're going to have it right there on their phone, right there on their tablet, um, where they can, you know, they can, they can watch everything. Um, 
but on that Luda and Nelly, I was reading somewhere where they said that uh, Timberland sent out both of them like a kit on like, you know, you know, this will help your Wi-Fi, this is what you use to set up your speakers and everything. And that Luda used his and Nelly didn't. So that was kind of oh, wow. uh, on, on, on the thing why, is, the only thing they need to the work on is uh is uh, sound. Sound sound could be better coming out your phone than coming out your uh like I try to put it on my surround sound, you know, it still didn't sound the same, man. If they can get that sound quality good, uh, that they're gonna have the game on lock. You know what I'm saying? That's why I think it, that's why I think they have to like like I said, I got a proven concept. It's time to package it up and it's time to, you know, take it to a bigger platform. Like, cause IG, you know, they can cap it at any point. Cause that's what they were doing at first. Like, cause if we, I don't know if you guys watched the baby face and, and the, the, the Teddy Riley, like they got 800,000. And then all of a sudden IG's go shut it down. It's like, look, we, we need to shut this down. I'm not sure. I'm not sure they did that, but it just felt like it. Cause they couldn't do the, the two person stream. Like it, it felt that way. Felt like they, like they capped it. So I, why 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 Timberland and Swiss? You know I know they're, they're they're legends in the game, so they probably got connects where a lot of people don't. They probably got connects where they can go and say, hey, let's move this off this platform where we don't own this. You know we don't mm-hmm. own you know Instagram, Mark Zuckerberg. They can do what they want to because it's theirs, and we can put a cap on it at any point. So why cap our culture? stop us from getting the greatness that we want because I really wanted to see that. Like, I, I really wanted to see that Luda because I went out first out like, oh, that's a good battle because if you think about it, look back at their numbers, the numbers really similar, but Luda just had mm-hmm. for those South bangers, you know, Luda got the you know, Air Force Ones and all that, but Luda just had the South. And when he started playing the records again, man, it just felt like we was all back in the Man, we were yeah. Man, boy, hey, boy, I thought about when we went to the uh, Capital City Classic one year, man. You kept playing Lovers and that. Friends. You, you played Lovers and Friends the whole, the whole way down there. The whole way down there, yeah. Because <laughs> yeah. that's when it first came out. Right, right. It, man, it took you back down memory lane, man. It's, it's, it shows our age, but, man, it, brought, it also brought back an uh, old memory from good times. Yeah. I know it's kind of really off, the subject, off the subject a little bit, off the subject a little bit, but uh, when we was at that Capital City Classic, that's where uh, the Malice and the Palace happened. I don't know if you remember, uh, like an yeah, Applebee's yeah, yeah. or somewhere, and we were watching the game, they started firing paper. Wow. I remember watching it live, well, not, not the game, but I watched. I was watching on TV when it happened. Yeah, know. we was at Applebee's on Candleline Road. Damn sure would. Damn sure in Jack, yep. sure would. Yeah, that's why I always, always remember that. Uh, that was the same weekend. Who did you guys think was going to win it though? You know, before the music got popped out, who did you think was going to take that take that battle? Uh, I, I, I said, um, I like Luda personally, so I was, I was, you know, I, I wrote with Luda. But you know, when you when you think about it, you go back and look at it, man. Luda had his songs lined up in the in the in the, in the, in the perfect form. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, he had his songs lined up. You know what I'm saying? He, you know, it, it just it just clicked for him like Nelly is just going off with Luda. He was trying to go out with Luda, but uh, it's like uh, Luda had a game plan. You know what I'm saying? Nelly just playing shit. You know, what you I'm definitely saying? have a strategy going into these battles because you already know what's going to be his. Like you already know Luda got, you know, he got tip. You know, you know Luda. He's ready for tip drill. He's ready for the Tim McGraw record. He's ready for those records. So he's already like, all right, when he play this, I'm gonna play this. So you gotta have a, like I said, you gotta have a game plan when you're going. And I feel like that Nelly didn't have a game plan. I don't, and I think that came into play where he just was being cocky. And I'm like, Luda, what, I'm like, I'm like, I'm like, Nelly, what records are you playing? Why can you never heard in a battle? Like, this is not the time to be playing around. Like this guy coming at your neck with these records and he coming, he hitting them with the bangers. You know, even though in the beginning, it just seemed like the, the, the competition just was so far apart. Although, you know, at the end, it kind of came a little bit closer because Luda was kind of then, then Luda kind of started playing some of the records. It was like, ah, oh, Luda, why you play that one? That ain't the one. That ain't even, that's not even in your record. That's somebody else's record. Like, you know, and that's why I was kind of like trying to keep up the scoring. Like, all right, I deduct the point for that. I get it to, to, uh, to nail it because Luda, this ain't really your, this ain't your record. Like, the, he played the Nas record. I'm like, Luda, you got better records. Why would you play the Nas record? And that's when I kind of thought that Nelly kind of closed the gap a little bit, even though Nelly was playing just terrible. This playlist was just terrible. Yeah, I agree. I'm a, I'm a Nelly fan. Like, well, I ain't listened to Nelly for a long time, but like, I used to be like a big Nelly, St. Lunatics, Mercury League, Autumn Cat. I used to listen to all that stuff. And Nelly played like two or three songs I had never heard of. In my life. <laughs> I was like, what the hell? 
like the biggest song. I'm like, I, I don't think I ever heard that biggest song from him. That or was it? What is it? Was it the biggest song? Or he played some song, some New York song he played. And I'm like, bro, why would you play that? Like, mm -hmm. hey, like get in your bag, especially early. I'm like, and he played tip drill way too early. I'm like, dude, you, I'm like, you play tip drill. I'm like, dude, why you tip drill so early? Like you already know you gotta say that before. It's like back that ass up. That's like that's like right. you gotta say that in the bag. I was saying, cause Luda, cause you think about Luda say lovers and friends for the dilemma. I was like, all right, we 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 know he got to play the. He was like at the 15 round, like, look, we know this dilemma coming, which I thought he should have played earlier. Like, we know this dilemma coming, got to play it. And by the time he played it, it was too late, cause little soon he played it, he played lovers and friends, and it just it just smashed it. it just smashed. Did Nelly even play number one? His playlist was trash. Yeah, trash. It's like jamming in the room, and Nelly's just, I mean, and Luda's just like, really? <laughs> I feeling that record, bro. Like, what's up? And then I was looked like before the battle, I had looked at like the chart. Like, I saw a meme where they had somebody put all the charts. Like, they numbers were really similar. Like, three Grammys, Billboards, top 100, 200s, and all that type of stuff. It was kind of, the numbers were really similar when you look back on it. But Nelly just, I mean, said Luda just had those, just those, those hood bangers. He just had those eight away. Yeah. And that's when, you know, that's when you can't really focus on the numbers when you, when you, uh, when you talk about music, man, because, you know, back then, man, we were, we were, uh, pirates, man. We were pirates, man. You know what I'm saying? We weren't, we weren't paying for no music. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, yep. you know what I'm saying? Right. You know what I'm saying? So, in, um, in, uh, Luda, um, I know I ain't never bought no Luda CD. <laughs> you know that, but I like Luda. <laughs> yep, man, that's how I feel. Like I never yeah. was never just the, the biggest Luda fan. I like Luda on features. I love Luda on Luda on features. Like I didn't really like just his whole albums. You know, I like him when he on feature because he would just tap a feature. He'd come through a tap a feature. And I heard his mm -hmm. was jamming, but just listening back to his music and listening to them classes that you know, you know, he had those classes. But when he play them, and even before the battle started, he was playing other music. And I'm just like. Luda just got some hits, man. Luda got some bangers. And I'm like, Nelly, come on, drop your records, bro. Like, yeah, Luda. Hey, bro, come on. Yeah. Now, what battle would y'all want to see? What y'all want to see? Man, I would want to see T.I. versus Jeezy, dog. Like, a T.I. versus 2 Chainz, you know what I'm saying? Something like that, some trap, some some, some trap music, dog. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. You think Jeezy got, got, got you? Yeah, that, that's... Uh, G's got 20 hits that stack up the TI. G's got some 20 hits to stack up. That's what I would that's why I would say TI versus two chains then. You know what I'm saying? Two chains a little bit got a little bit bigger catalog, I, I I would say. You know what I'm saying? But you know what what I like from two chains is not might not be what everybody else like about two chains, you know what I'm saying? Titty boy era. I like the titty boy era. Yeah, like the mixtape era, you know what I'm saying? More era, you know, like because yeah. Yes. Yeah, you know, I was on the, I was on the two chain era. I was more like, I like the Titty Boy era. Yeah, that's what we grew. Up. That's what we, that's what we started listening to Titty Boy. I still call him Titty Boy. You know what I'm saying? Boy, when he was on the Titty Boy era, he put out the, the projects, and then he kind of went kind of like two chain. He flipped it, you know, kind of got what he put it signed with. I think was it, uh, uh, dang it, Kanye. He signed with Yeezy. He signed with Yeezy. good music. Was good music. He was a good music. And you can kind of see that his his music evolved. But we, you know, when you grew up in the trap with somebody, you kind of get stuck with that that first, when you first kind of hear them, and you don't really kind of evolve with the artist. So, you know, some of the records still bang, but that Titty Boy era, like I said, it'll be probably a lot of records that, you know, him and the Duffel, like Devil Bag Boys and all that type yeah. of yeah. boys and rings. But a lot of people might not know the Duffel Bag Boy era. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Really kind of got on. So. The battle I want to see, like, so it's crazy, like, me and some of my partners, we, we be, uh, like, doing little fake battles on Zoom, like, all of us get on Zoom and be drinking and stuff, tripping out, we'll do battles. We do, we did, uh, Pac versus Biggie, um, somebody talk about doing, they talk about doing, a, a what was it, like, the Eye Brothers versus Earth, Wind, and Fire, so, like, I like some of these, like, fantasy ones that have never happened. Mm -hmm. um, Oh, they did Michael Jackson versus Prince the other night. Ooh, oh, man. So that was cool. But as far as something that, that, that yeah, it was it was crazy. Um, but like as far as something that that'll uh, happen, I think that um, 
I'm looking forward to the 112 versus Jacket Edge. That should be a pretty good one. And then, you know, I would like to see Usher versus Chris Brown. Um, that'll be a good one. And then, the one that I would really like to see, but I know it won't happen, is R. Kelly versus anybody. I know, like, R. Kelly is canceled. And, you know, he did, he, he did horrible things. Yo, know, nobody really was seeing R. Kelly, man. Yeah, yeah, that's true. He had a deep catalog, man, because, like, yeah. all the crazy stuff that he went through, during that time, you know, we, we knew, but we didn't know. I remember being in high school when we was on our senior trip, and we were down in Florida, we got to Disneyland, Disney World, whatever. And he came through there, and, bro, it was a massive, the crowds were massive around him, bro. Like, star studded. I'm like, like, when you saw him, you was like, like, that's R. Kelly. Like, that's R. Kelly, bro. Like, then to just see, like, years after and to see the, you know, I didn't even watch the documentary because I didn't want to see it. Yeah, it's wild. Yeah, it's it crazy. Because it was, I just, like, I can't even see it, you know what I'm saying? And she was like, we can't, I can't listen to this but I was like, the guy had those hit, yeah, classic hits, bro. Like, hit after hit. Hit after hit, that hit, man. Hit after hit, you know what I'm saying? It's, it's, it's sad to that where that music came from, you know what I'm saying? It'd be so talented to see where, you know, that from out of a dark place like that. Even though sometimes I would think artists kind of go in their bag and they kind of get some like a dark place sometimes and kind of write about it. But to write about that, it, you know, that's, that's unthinkable, man. You can't write about that, you know? Yeah, that's, that's wild, bro. It's wild, you know? I mean, but yeah, those battles, man. I really, I really, and I've really been enjoying them and digging and eating them up, man. Like, I think like a Trey Songs or Trey Song, Chris Brown, stuff like that. I think those R and B ones would be kind of like a little bit, a little bit different for us. Like, I really was like five until the Erica Badu and Jill Scott, man. I'm talking. Yeah, that was good. That was good. Yeah, that was a vibe, man. It was. A, I was on it the whole time. It was like a two-hour thing, bro. I was just like, I don't even care who wins. It's not even about who wins. I'm just vibing right now, bro. It was like, it's just. It was just like it was so good for the soul. <laughs> mm -hmm, that good soul for music, man. You need that in your life. That that, that good ear music, man. It was just good for the soul, man. Cause sometimes you get so polluted with the rap, and then when you get some good soul R and B, man. It's just you, you feel full. I just felt so full after I listened to it. Yeah, you felt you feel joy, you know what I'm saying? You feel you know what I'm saying? You, you feel <laughs> like 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 uh like gospel music almost man. It just it just did something to you did something to your spirit, you know what I'm saying? Just make you feel good. Uh, yeah. And I I was kinda little I was a little kinda like uh upset a little bit that that the three six and the thing that happened because I was on, I was like, man, let's go. Man, I read it for it. DJ Paul was on that would have been nice. That would have been nice. Playing them, you know, he was playing them bangers before he even he was like, "All right, man, I got something for y'all, man." But I got some good news and bad news. Basically, I'm like, "I'm like, why y'all ain't you know set this up beforehand?" And you know, because he said that they kind of did it on the cuff. Just him, and, him, and uh, I think was it crazy. One, one of them, I can't remember exactly who it was, but they had did they had already set it up. Then, like right before it came on, Tim had hit them like, "Hey, look, man, save it for verses." He was like, "I was ready, man." He was just playing them bangers. I was like, "Man, I'm ready." And then they could that's. That's what I grew up on, you know what I'm saying? That Memphis music. That 3-6, that's I, man. That's us right there, you know? Right. <laughs> so, that, that, that music, like, I was more on to 3-6, Cash Money, No Limit, than I was on, like, that North music, that, that North music. Right, right. Like, I was listening to Nas, you know. You man, know. I, really, I really ain't really get on no no Memphis music till I got up there to start with y'all, man. And For real. Uh, Shoot down, you know, down the south Mississippi where I'm from, man. We gonna make cash with no limit. Yeah, heavy. Yeah, heavy. Yeah. So we like, was I, like still to this day, my my favorite verses uh, from Wayne is uh, from Making That Dream. He was 15 years old. You know what I'm saying? And so uh, the blues on that heavy. Before, like, I, only thing I knew about Memphis. Play a fly, nobody need nobody. That's like the only Memphis song I did, <laughs> uh, at that point. And then uh, Ted Club of Three Six. You had to hear that one. You had to, man, had to, you had to hear that man. You had to hear that. We so you know, from two hours away, so we were so influenced by. It. We was like, like you were getting like a lot of cash money, but we were lucky enough to get cash money, Three Six, UGK, A Ball. Uh, we were still getting like Play a Fly, Skinny Pimp. We were getting, we were getting, it was getting a no limit. So we were getting all that mystical. We were getting, you know, we was getting fiend. We were getting, mm -hmm. we 
we turn around, we get the cash more, we get, we get, because think about it, we, if you really look back on it, it was more BG supposed to have been the guy out of there. But it's just BG like- BG definitely was supposed to be the guy. I was a big BG fan. Like I was a big BG fan. But yeah. it so happened, BG got locked up, then Juvenile made harm, and then Juvenile went up. And then, yeah. then him and- uh, 400, when he dropped 400 degrees, that was, that was, oof. Kind of so there. 400 degrees came out in like 98, I think. And then in 99, Lil Wayne came out with Block and man. Hey man, why, hey, watch uh, Hip Hop Evolution. They talk about that shit. On Netflix. I'm gonna check that out. Yeah, they talk about the new the, the newest season, they talk about that. Bro, cause that was that that was that way back then. Cause you cause you think about it, you had you had P he was put he was gonna he was dropping music like every week. Like he was dropping silk man. He was a soldier, you know, fiend. Uh, not, it was not Missy Elliott, but uh, what was her name? Mia X. Mia X. Mia X. Uh, Ladylike. Yeah. He dropped yeah. It. Come back with his project. Then you come back with the, the, the collaborative yeah. project with everybody. Then you you get cash money. Come with with the, with the juvenile. Then G. Then you got you know it was just so much of that just that music. So we weren't even getting none of that North music. You know we was we was getting like then, then you had you think about it, you had A Ball MJG coming out of the, coming out of Memphis. Then you turn around you had UGK coming out of Texas. So we weren't even really on that North music. Like, we was on UGK heavy. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? Like we would listen to, I would listen to Nas, but we weren't, we weren't really on, like, but we listened to Biggie, you know, we heard Biggie on the radio, but we weren't, you know, in my time, we was on that, we was on that 36, like, he was, like we was on 36 back then. Like, that's all we were listening to. Man, back in the day, you couldn't tell me and Jason nothing, like we weren't from Memphis, dog. That's, I mean, the Project Pat, man, <laughs> Coops the nigga, the Crunch it. Like all of them, dog. Like gangsta boo, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Skin of pimp and all those guys, man. We like Scarface, Al Capone, man. Like, dog. you can go on and on, man. If it's loose, it's out. You know? And then later on, after that wave, then you had then you had your guy coming up out there after that. Yeah. Wave. Had, oh man. When your guy hit, it was just like, oh, I'm on this. This, you know, white cheese. We all in, you know what I'm saying? We all in. And then by that time, the music started getting a little bit more than them. You know, you start hearing more to die. You know, then, then you get a Jeezy, then, then, you, then you kind of get a little flow. You get Ross kind of start making that effort, coming in kind of with his music. So it was like all that was kind of like balanced. Then you had Gucci in there. You know, Gucci was that grime down. You know, yeah, Gucci was grinding as well too. So you just like, cause when we was in college. And that Gucci like 2008 Gucci. You know what I'm saying? Like, we we that Gucci. Yeah, back Gucci, you know what I'm saying? So that was our yes. influence. Like, that was our music influence. Like, of course, we had pop, you know, Snoop, you know, come out the West Coast, but our influence was just right there in that bubble because we were two hours away from it. So we were here, like, it wouldn't even be on the radio yet. It, mm -hmm. R, it was like somebody probably went to Memphis for Memphis in May, came back with a, came back with a tape. Yeah. And everybody dubbed the tape. Everybody <laughs> <laughs> put in the, in the, in the, in the, uh, in the dub it over, make sure you get the dub. Like put the tape, doing the tape. So that's how we got our music a lot of the time. So just that music, man. We, we that music is so influential to us, man. And going back to those times and just listen to when we was in college and listen to that music when we was in college, man. Take us back. How y'all yeah. about the music industry now, man? Ti Ti is Ti Ti was like my guy in college. Uh, well, Kanye was my guy, but like Ti as far as like trap music was like. 24, Dope Boy Fresh, you know, Urban all that, Legend. You know, Urban Legend, I'm Serious, yeah. you know, all, all that was, you know, and like, was motor, I think Motivation, all that came. Oh, man, I can still remember right now, like, like, oh, listening to Motivation, man, like, this, 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 the back seat that's knocking, you know, you know what I'm saying, uh, like, for real, it, even Frank driving the, uh, uh, the green, uh, green marquee, man, with the, with the 20 foes on, man, that's how we used to play, you know what I'm saying? I used to beat that, that trap, I used to beat that trap music, that urban <laughs> legend, that was it, man. I just beat them track, them CDs up, bro. They, like you know, I put something in the deck. I just leave it in the deck. Oh, mm -hmm. <laughs> they were like, man, you ain't gonna change the CD. I'm like, for what? I'm like, I'm just, right. bro, I'm just gonna let this thing play. So, man, just like that music, just we we so that music is so like looking back, I was like, man, I should have went to Miami. Like, I should just I should not even try to get to Atlanta. But that music had us so like we gotta get to Atlanta. I gotta get to Atlanta. Uh, 
man. Music in the strip club, dog. <laughs> man, I remember one time we got a see you now I got my refund shit like right with no spring break or something. And the SEC tournament was in Atlanta. And like, man, we rolled out. I ain't even had nowhere to stay. Nothing. My you know, my roommate played ball, so I uh, shoot, I slept on the floor in Bubby room. Uh, like they, you know, they, they going to the, they going to, they, man, Stanbury would have killed her, killed them if they knew I was in there. Uh, so, we, I'm just trying to get to the A to kick it. I'm trying to kick it, bro. I remember, I know the, the weekend that made me want to go when I went to All-Star Weekend. I was like, oh, you remember, I was there, I was with you. We went to All-Star Weekend, bro. Kinda, uh, hey, like, I got to get here. I don't know what it's going to take. I got to get here, man. We, nah, we, we, we were 19 years old, dog. We was, in, we was in all we went to all-star weekend and i think that was the best time i probably had at my at that point in my life bro like we was getting in the strip club we was going like multiple strip clubs getting in i'm like 19 like i said we were 19 getting in the strip clubs so i'm like i gotta get today if this is what it's like if this is what it's like <laughs> i gotta nah, get we, we 19 years old and strokers because it's like like man listen to life dog. like we didn't know we didn't know what was going on man like that shit was so crazy yeah. i vividly remember that shit man and that was that was that was the weekend that made me want to move today. Like I gotta get here. I don't care what it's gonna take. I gotta get here. I, I gotta get here. Like at some point in my life, I gotta live in Atlanta. And then I got there, and then it wasn't like that night, that weekend. I was, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you get there, you like, cause all you know, growing up, that's all we used to hear. Like Atlanta's the place to be because of the mm-hmm. life going and things like that. Then you get there, and everybody got that same dream, and mm-hmm. don't end enough jobs. Around there trying to get a job, it was just like it was just it got tough. And I, you know, you party every night, you trying to get, you living because you know you come from a small town. You know, I'm coming from Cleveland, living in Starver. You know, then all of a sudden you get thrown into Atlanta. You're like, I can party on Monday. They party on Monday. They party on Tuesday. You know, right. Somewhere they party. It'd be Friday, Saturday party or Thursday. You know, in college, but in, in, in the A they party every every night. night. Yeah, and, and it's still gone to this day. Yeah, they took to, to, until the sun come up, you know. And then, and then driving to Memphis every other weekend. Oh. It was just like, we go to Memphis, get up at 8, 9 o'clock at night, like, let's go to Memphis. You drive to Memphis, and you just run around Memphis, hitting all them strip clubs up, and hitting all them parties, that type of stuff. So when, by the time you get to the age where you can actually do all that stuff, you're like, man, I don't really want to do it, you know. Man, that's that's the crazy thing, man. I, I, y'all know I grew up out in New Orleans, and so like we was, man, it's crazy. We was in high school. Me and my homeboy talk about this all the time. We was in high school. We played a full back basketball game. Ride on the bus back to school. We like, yo, it's ten o'clock. Let's go to New Orleans. And we out there on Bourbon Street. It was, just, <laughs> you know, we like seventeen. You know, like, and it ain't nothing to do. We just walking up and down the street. You know what I'm saying? And then we got introduced to this strip club called the Roxbury. And well, hands down, to this day, that's the best strip club I've ever been to in my life. To this day, I done been to Vegas, Atlanta, Miami. I ain't no, and I don't. I might just be biased because I was, you know, a kid, and I was just like overstimulated. I don't know how we got in. I'm a senior in high school, you know, so I might have probably had, you know, I probably had just left my Letterman Jack in the car or something. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Senior in high school, Rockbury. Man, we were going to Rockbury like, you know, every other weekend, 17 years old, getting around the car, you know, on the interstate, punching, getting out there. But, but it's like you say, when you, when you got to the age, like, I didn't like going to New Orleans, man. I mean, it's cool, like, my wife want to go, um, go back, like, fight classic and stuff. But, like, uh, like going to Bourbon Street and all that, man, I did that when I was 15, 16, 17. Right. That's how I feel about me. Why I never wanted to move to Memphis because I went there so much growing up that I was like, you know, you're going down on Beale Street, you know, that's the little Bourbon, the, the little North North Bourbon, you know, going on Beale Street. <laughs> You're hitting that all the time, and then all of a sudden you get to the age, you're like, man, I'm not moving to Memphis, man. I, I, I didn't, ain't nothing to get for Bill Street. I ain't trying to go to Bill Street no more, so I totally get it, man. And I think that's the best thing for, you know, for black kids, like I said, coming up, you have to move out of your town and go to other cities to kind of get that, 
get the experience from other cities instead of just not staying in your hometown all your life. You know, it's good to kind of stay there and then move. You don't like where you're going to you kind of move back for whatever reason. But just to get out and kind of experience another city and experience what, what other places have to offer, I think that's really good. And that's what, that being one of my motivations to like move around the country because I mean, when I was coming up, man, I was in that little small town, less than 10,000, bro. And it was like, you really just saw that it was really no vision that people had. It's like they grow up, they, they live, and they almost die in the same house that they were born. Mm-hmm. And I just didn't want to have that, you know, I didn't want to have that feeling. So my pops always wish to tell me, he's like, it ain't, it don't matter where you started, you, you can go wherever you want. You just, you just gotta, you know, put your mind to it. So when I hit turn 18, bro, I started to starve. You know, soon school was over. I went to the first semester of summer school. I'm like, I can't, I can't look back since. Went to Star to Nashville, Atlanta to Jacksonville, back to Atlanta. You know, you know, out here to California, and then who knows where I'll probably go after this? Like, it ain't no, it ain't no big deal to pick up and move, man, to go experience something. Well, I'm so glad you moved to 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 the Bay, man, because I always wanted to go to the Bay, dog. Like, man, you and you knew I loved the Bay. You know I love the Bay, dog. You gotta have people to move in different places. Otherwise, you can't, you ain't got nowhere to go visit. Mm-hmm. Got nowhere to go visit, man. Yeah, I was just talking to one of my partners from high school that's in Dallas. And he was like, man, come on down here, man. Bring your old lady. She can go hang with the wife. We, you know, we can go to a Cowboys game. We can do this, we can do that. I need to get out there to the, to the Bay pool with y'all. I know we all talk about going to Vegas uh, in December for the, uh, for the Raiders game. That's that, you know, we had, I think we at this stage in our life where everybody can kind of, you know, move, how they move around, around a little bit more, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, man, because that's the only thing it's about now, man. You know, once you get them 30 to 35 plus, man, it's about experiencing life a little bit more and seeing things. You know, just going to the club, just stand up, that ain't no experience for me no more. You know, I want to go out and go see something I ain't seen before. And, you know, you got your I ain't, you got I ain't going to no club. You know what I'm saying? Like I go, you know, that's why I like to see my partners live, y'all live in different places so they give us an opportunity, give us a reason to go somewhere, you know. If we all stand in, in the same city or, or the next state over, it's like, you know. It, for what? Yeah, you, you know? know. So that's why, you know, I'm out in the face where I get people say, you know, let's go to, you know, we got somebody out there, let's go out there and spend the weekend. So that, you know, give people opportunities to travel, man. That's what my pops would tell me. It's like, you know, my sister, because I got two sisters, like, Y'all don't all need to be staying in the same places. Like, you guys need to be spread out because there's something going on. Because think about it, man, we all was in Dallas and the pandemic hit and we can't do nothing because we all there together. But if we spread out, something really go on. Like, all right, man, we can pick up, we can move to California for a little. Mm-hmm. You know, think about it, like when you said you was in New Orleans when the, when the dam burst. You know, a lot of my family from down there when Katrina hit, all my family down there, they don't really have nowhere to go. And so what they had to do, some of them came back up to Mississippi, some of them went to Houston, you know, stuff like that. But if you have somebody else a little bit further away, you might can start a new life. Because think about Katrina. Right. Katrina here, they got them chicks, you know, they got them female chicks, and you can start a whole new life. Right. That's how that's how I got up here. That's I've been up here since Katrina. That's how I oh, got really? there. You know, Damn. you know, part of the reason. Yeah, like I love like a week before Katrina and and when I wanted to come, like, I ain't like it at first, and I wanted to come back. But Katrina had me, you know, go for it was like, Dunzo. Fucked up. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah you know, and, and really, honestly, go for it ain't, ain't been the same over 50 years, so go for it ain't the same. Like, yeah, nothing nothing, nothing, nothing like, been the same man. since Katrina, man. Uh, nothing, nothing the same. Like, that's, that's like, you talk to people from the coast, they be like, they say, oh, yeah, that was before the storm, but that was after the storm. That's like, you know, like a point in everybody's life. And I think this, that's kind of like how the pandemic going to end up being. You know what I'm saying? Like, oh, you know, before the pandemic, we could, you know, just that and the third. But now, yeah, just, you know. Yeah, just like, just, uh, you know, just, just like we just know, say, the before, before, before 9-11 and after 9-11, you know, like how everything changed, you know what I'm saying? Yep. It's, it's just those things in, in, in lifetime, man. You, yep. When you think about it, all the things like we really witnessed in our lifetime, bro, it's, it's amazing. You know what I'm saying? Like, we, we just seen the towers fall. Yeah, we, we still young. Katrina. Right. We see Katrina, uh, the pandemic. You know what I'm saying, man? We we didn't see no lot. You know what I'm saying? And I was talking about this on one of my earliest podcasts. You know, I do, some, I do, a, I do a virtual one. It's like the first couple of virtual ones I did, but the first couple of ones I was doing by myself. And I talked about like how, you know, our generation 
has been, been through two recessions already. Like our parents, like our the baby boomers, they only they've only been through probably one recession. Our generation has been through two recessions already. So I think our generation will be the strongest when it's when it's all said and done because we went through a recession back in 2000, you know, 2008, and we turn around here come through a pandemic where the, where the economy come to a halt, and then we kind of going to be able to thrive after this. So I think our generation is going to be the strongest when it's all said and done because nobody else is no other generation has one has, has been through this. You know, because think about it, we came out of school. When I came out of school, I remember coming out of school, going to Nashville, and as soon as I got to Nashville, the economy just went bottom out. You couldn't even find a job. Like, you know, you couldn't do nothing. And then we kind of kind of got back, got back on our feet and started over again. And then you kind of get through life and then boom, they go another one. You know, 10, 15 years later, go another one that happened. And you kind of go through this one the first couple of months, and it's gonna take a while for the economy and everything to get back to get back to normal. But it's gonna be our generation to get us through it. And get this new technology back up and going, and get us get us to the next generation. Then the next generation is going to be the ones who come along and benefit from everything like we benefited from the baby boomer generation. So, you know, our generation is going to be the strongest when it's all said and done. I think. Yeah, yeah, we are the strongest yeah, generation. If you ask me. Yeah, but they they you know everybody talk about you know uh, our generation. And, Daisy and we don't want to do anything, but we just found that we just woke up, man. I think we, our generation, finally got an opportunity to wake up. We, we went over to taking that force-fed information that they gave us, like grow up, go to college, get a degree, go find a job, sit on a job for 20, 25 years. Like you know, we woke up. We was like, oh man, we not with that no more, man. We not sitting around for no 25 years at no job. They don't want to pay us. We out to the next job. You know? Right. We're gonna go start our own career. We're gonna start our own job, start our own business. You paying me sixty thousand a month, you know, six thousand a year. I can go make this in a, in a month with my new, you know, say my new hustle. So I just think our generation is starting to wake up and realize that, you know, we don't, we no longer have to go and just work for somebody else. Like it's, it's taken me personally, it's taken me a lot longer to unlearn a lot of the stuff that was that I learned growing up. You know what I mean? It just takes a lot. Yeah, of, yeah. You know, to try to unlearn that stuff and try to learn it. Yeah. Make sure I don't put that in my kids. I'm trying to put something different into my kids. And what was put into me? Cause it's it's hard, man. Unlearning that stuff. It's in your. It's it's embedded in your DNA. You know, yep. So, like stick, just like like uh, like I tell my mama, you know, like y'all told me to stick it out. You know, it's sometimes not always good to stick it out. You know what I'm saying? It's, like, it's okay to move on. You know what I'm saying? You can you can, you can get up and pick pick yourself back up. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It might it might not be what you think it is, but it's okay to to pick up and go do something totally different than what you than what you're accustomed to. You know what I'm saying? And I think some of the biggest, some of our biggest problems is we don't want to see be seen as a failure to our friends and to the people that you know that know us because nobody wants to be seen starting from the bottom. Like when I started this podcast, I was like, man, I don't care what nobody say. Like I can only have two people listen. I'm gonna shoot it to the homies. They listen to it. They listen to it. They don't. I'm just gonna keep throwing it out there. Eventually, somebody's gonna listen to it. Then two people gonna tell another person. This person gonna tell another person. But I'm not afraid to let people start from the bottom and I think that's our biggest fear that is like when you start something new you got to be like you know nobody knows you you don't you don't have a, you don't have a, a lot of the confidence that you think you're going to have because you think people are going to be judging you like ah oh, look at him ha ah. and that's what we've been talking our DNA when we're coming up because if you doing something different what's the first thing your friends did to you when you was a kid they laughed at you yeah that DNA, you know, is, is, is embedded in you. So when you get a little bit older, you try to break that mold, you gotta have that, like what I call that fucking attitude. Like, I don't care what they say or what nobody say, whether it's good, bad, and different, I'm just gonna keep pushing. So, yeah, yeah. man, like myself, I just, you know, I just be always thinking like new ideas of trying to do something, man, trying to incorporate my buddies, to incorporate the homies, try to figure out ways to kind of bring us all together. So we, cause man, we talk about all this stuff in the chat, but it's time to kind of like, better to kind of put it out there, put the information out there to the It's, it's time to, 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 you know, put some, put some on paper, honestly. Yeah, and develop a plan, yeah. And that's what I'm saying, like with all this, all this money being transaction, all this money that being flowing that we don't even get a chance to see. I think that, like I said, our generation is now being able to realize that, hey, look, we can get a piece of that pie too by, you know, using YouTube, using YouTube University to kind of do this thing. Cause we go sit in those classrooms and you being taught by somebody who's never actually did the work, which is which is kind of, if you think about it, it's kind of crazy. They just, they teach us wow. Teach you all theory, but they even, if you go to your marketing teacher and be like, all right, man, so have you went out there and got your own, got some of these markets? Like, nah, you're like, 
What? Like you tried out, you haven't tried out, you just talking about this stuff that's happening in the book, but you never actually put it into action. So they're teaching us how to be more of a student, you know what I'm saying, being more of an employee and be a more of a owner. And so I think that that us to kind of use these different avenues, social media, YouTube, YouTube, you know, you know, all these other platforms to kind of educate ourselves so we can kind of learn, get this information that we didn't get when we was growing up. So yeah. And towards this, once the pandemic over, what do you guys kind of got planned for, you know, progressing and kind of moving your life forward to the next step? I mean, man, I'm come, I'm gonna come out better than I was when I came in, man. Uh, you know, I, uh, long story short, you know, honestly, man, I ain't really worked since December 17th of 2019, man. So I've been, I've been on, I've been, uh, I done made some serious life changes, so you know, I ain't nowhere but up for me, man. So you know, I I got I got goals that I never had before, you know what I'm saying? So that I'm that I know I'm going to accomplish. But you know, it's just the only time will tell when I when I, when they'll be accomplished. But it's gonna be accomplished, you know what I'm saying? So I I get a total 180, man. You know what I'm saying? So it's just it's just been eye opening to me, man. So much I've learned so much in these past four or five months, man. Since I've been just really focusing on myself and really focusing on my craft, man, you know, you know, this, like, this game, this game of confidence, like you just said, man, no matter what I'm gonna do, you know what I'm saying, so just letting the fear go, man, just, just saying, uh, and just doing what I, what I love to do, man, you know what I'm saying, so I, to, I see, um, I'm coming out better than where I was before I came, before this even hit, man, you know what I'm saying, so. And boy, how do you, what do you see yourself out today? Yeah. I actually, um, y'all might know, probably maybe not know, but uh, my dad owns an accounting firm back home. And so we kind of trying to uh, transition where I can buy, like, and I work for an accounting firm here in Iowa. Where I'm a corporate accountant. But like, uh, we, we kind of in talks for me to take over everything, kind of move it a little bit more on the virtual side, where whereas he's had a, you know, a brick and mortar office for the past. 25 or so years, he's like, I can run everything from here. And the crazy thing about it is that the pandemic is showing us, like, you can do things virtually, you know, and I've been telling him this probably for 10 years, I'm like, yo, you can let the office go. Um, but, like, now, like, all transactions are pretty much being done virtually, and that's just something that we're working towards doing, and I'm probably, by the end of this year, probably not going to be working for nobody else and try to you know, um, take over the family business. And this is just kind of like, a, you know, I've been working from home for the past, what, I guess, three months now. And so this is just kind of, you know, I'm working from home for somebody else. And at the same time, I'm able to work on what's been my side project for the past couple of years. And I'm putting a little bit more time into it. And, you know, it's good. You know, I got young kids. And so, like, this freedom, quote unquote, freedom of being at home, I haven't put no clothes on to go to nobody's office, you know, and still getting everything done. And so, it's, it's just makes everything all very enough. Yeah, and I, and I really, you know, I, I look at the positive side of the pandemic, man, and giving us an opportunity to kind of, you know, hone in those ideas that we, we had in the back of our mind because me personally i had this podcast in the back of my mind for the last year or two but because you know like i said i got young kids two wife working you know going back and forth to see trying to do your side hustle i'm trying to do photography and all that good stuff and you spend a lot of time on this stuff so you don't really have the additional extra time to go and kind of start something new and with this um pandemic it gave me an opportunity to be like all right man you got time there's no more excuses now like you're at home you're home 24 7 no, everybody else at home, you have nothing, you know, I'm still working, you still work from home. At the same time, you don't, you do have time enough to go and figure out how to do this or how to set this up with a piece of technology that you need to make this happen. So that's, so that's why I take the positive from it. So like once this pandemic is over for me, I'm gonna look back and be like, man, this is why I kind of, I started, you know, doing the pandemic, you know, as long as I keep my foot on it and keep going, knows where it's gonna go because I feel like the podcast game is it's, it's a lot of podcasts out there. As long as you kinda like doing your you and your lane and you're doing your thing, it's gonna it's gonna be good for whomever decide to do it. And so this was something that I, I have been wanting to do and now I got the opportunity to do it. So 
and I, I appreciate you guys coming on. And you know, I know it's late for you guys. I'm not gonna hold you guys up too much longer. You know, I appreciate you guys coming on and spending time with me and talking. We're definitely gonna link back up. You guys are part of the man. We're gonna come back, bring you back on. We're gonna probably bring some more of the homies on at some point. We all have a nice little chit chat so we can talk. Oh yeah. It's better to kind of talk. You know, we can talk in that chat and you can get, sometimes you can't get your point across in, in, in messaging. Whereas when you're talking, mm -hmm. talking to a person face to face, you can kind of clearly, you know, tell, you know, get to decipher what you're trying to say to somebody. You know, sometimes the technician, you, you misread them. You don't quite understand. Mm -hmm. 10 different people talking at one time, you're trying to read everything and keep up and get your point across. Whereas with something like this, you can kind of go back and kind of see, and you can exactly, when I see something, you can say it right back to me. Right. Something now, and then you replying back 20 minutes later, and then I reply back 10 minutes after that, so it's not the same, mm -hmm. not the same. So that's all like something a little bit more long format. And I kind of think that people will be a little bit more of a opportunity for them. Cause like me, I listen to podcasts when I'm on a train, when I'm riding around, when I'm going to work, or when I'm going to gym, when I'm at the gym. So I, I think about the, that type of stuff, and I want people to be able to listen to this when they're in the gym or something like that. You want to have something that you, because not all the time you want to listen to rap and all that type of stuff when you're working out. You don't want to listen to some some positive, some you know, some information to kind of help push your morale and things like that. And that's what I you know aspire to try to you know get that out and get this podcast out to people. So I I, I really thank you guys for coming on, man. So what we're gonna uh, really. do? You guys want to plug your, your IG or anything that you're working on? How about you, boy? Uh yeah, man. <laughs> I don't have none on my IG, but you know me and my family. Uh, boy James Four B O I D J A M E S T H E Four T H. Um, you know, follow me on Twitter, Instagram. You gonna see a whole bunch of pictures. You know, my kids running around being crazy, and uh, you know, me and me and my my better half. Uh, you know, we getting ready for this wedding, and so you'll see a bunch of you know wedding planning pics and things like that. Yeah, man. Congrats on that. How about you? How about you, B? You got? You wanna put look? Little or anything you working on got coming up, man. Just be on the lookout, man. I've been, you know, you did you get like uh, when you first started doing the uh, podcast, and I, I, I have been thinking about doing podcasts and blogs for like a uh, like small black for HBCUs and uh, small colleges for sports teams, just getting just getting uh, getting those players exposure. So I've been doing research and stuff on uh, just how to, how to start my own blog and stuff about about pushing those sports is my love, you know what I'm saying. So I've been getting ready to do a um. Uh, do a blog, I'm not sure, a blog or a podcast about uh, uh, black HBCUs and uh, the sports, the sports scene at HBCUs and just getting, getting somebody some exposure out there, man. So just be on the lookout for that, man. Yeah, man, you keep going. I might have a plug, I might have a plug for you on that. Uh, it's, it's a dude that I kind of know that, that already has a HBCU sports podcast. Oh, for real? And so, you know, we can chop it up tomorrow or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Uh, hmm. Which I'll tell you about it. <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> man. Uh, I read it. I appreciate it, man. Um, we're going to go ahead and wrap this up, man. You can always catch me at Doe Vision SF on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. You can catch me at Doe Vision SF at gmail.com for any, uh, if you want to get in contact with me. If you want to get on the website, you can get some of this Inspired by God merch. Some of the merch that I got in the t-shirts and hoodie I got on there. I got a couple of masks coming. I'm probably gonna be giving some masks away. I got some of the, uh, some of the masks that I, you know I've been setting up and putting on there. So you probably get to get that opportunity to get you a mask, get some free masks and some some free gear stuff like that on there for listen to the listen to the podcast. You know I want to kind of give away some stuff to kind of help some people out in this time. And I know it's hard. Stuff. I know it's kind of hard to get your hands on some things. So you know I'll probably be giving away some of those at some point. So. Again, I'd like to go ahead and wrap that up. I'll see you guys in the next podcast, man. Holla. All right.